This is the recording for the listening comprehension section of the final test exercise in the TOEFL test preparation kit. Now, use the eraser end of your pencil to open your test exercise book. Read the directions for section 1 in your book as you listen to the directions on this recording. Do not read ahead or turn the pages until you are told to do so. Test Exercise Section 1 Listening Comprehension In this section of the test, you will have an opportunity to demonstrate your ability to understand conversations and talks in English. There are three parts to this section, with special directions for each part. Answer all the questions on the basis of what is stated or implied by the speakers in this test. Do not take notes or write in your test book at any time. Do not turn the pages until you are told to do so. Part A. Directions. In Part A, you will hear short conversations between two people. After each conversation, you will hear a question about the conversation. The conversations and questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Here is an example. On the recording, you hear... I don't like this painting very much. Neither do I. What does the man mean? In your test book, you read A. He doesn't like the painting either. B. He doesn't know how to paint. C. He doesn't have any paintings. D. He doesn't know what to do. You learn from the conversation that neither the man nor the woman likes the painting. The best answer to the question, what does the man mean, is A. He doesn't like the painting either. Therefore, the correct choice is A. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin Part A with the first conversation. Number one. Have you been to the new gym since it opened? Are you kidding? Tomorrow's the deadline for my project. What does the man imply? Number two. I'd like to borrow that book after you've finished it. Sure, but I've promised it to Jane first. What does the woman intend to do? Number three. I could really use more room. My apartment is so small and there's no closet space. You should see the apartments in my building. You know, one of my neighbors is moving out. Come by and I'll bring you to his place. What does the man imply? Number four. The forecast calls for heavy snow again tonight. Aren't you glad we'll be getting away from this for a week? I sure am, but let's call tomorrow morning before we leave for the airport to make sure our flight hasn't been delayed or canceled. What does the woman suggest they do? Number five. Has anyone turned in a brown leather wallet? Mine seems to be lost and it has my driver's license in it, and also some family pictures that are pretty important to me. Oh, I think one like that was brought in this morning. Wait here just a minute, please. 
What will the woman probably do? Number six. I'd like you to come with me to the opening of the photography exhibit. I'm exhausted. You'll have to manage without me tonight. What will the woman probably do? Number seven. Guess what I just heard. Dave's selling that car of his that you like so much. Oh wow! I'll bet it's expensive, but it couldn't hurt to check it out. What will the man probably do? Number eight. I have an idea for a special issue of the school newspaper. Do you have time to discuss it? My class is over at one, but I'm free after that. What does the man mean? Number nine. Did you return that book to the library for me? I don't want to pay a fine. Don't worry about it. I took care of it. What does the man mean? Number ten. I'm really sorry I missed the pop art exhibit at the museum. You might try to catch it when it opens in New York next month. What does the woman suggest the man do? Number eleven. Wasn't there once a bakery here? Yes, but it went out of business last year. What does the woman mean? Number twelve. Oh, I'm so sorry. You must let me pay to have your jacket cleaned. That's all right. It could happen to anyone, and I'm sure that orange juice doesn't stain. What can be inferred about the woman? Number thirteen. What are your new blue jeans like? Oh, they're pretty much like the other ones, except with a larger waist. I guess I don't have much time to exercise these days. What can be inferred about the man? Number fourteen. If you're trying to fit this bookcase in here, you'll have to turn your desk sideways. I guess you're right, but I hate to lose the view I have from my window. What are the women doing? Number fifteen. Did you hear there's some new kind of cable television system that'll allow you to get five hundred channels? Yeah, but I have a hunch we'll have nothing to watch that's different from what we have now. What can be inferred from the man's reaction to the new television system? Number sixteen. I hope you remembered to pick up my clothes from the cleaners. I couldn't go because the car wouldn't start. What does the man mean?
Number 17. I must have told Mike five times not to forget the meeting, and he still missed it. Well, you know, Mike, everything's in one ear and out the other. What can be inferred about Mike? Number 18. Have you seen John since he started wearing contact lenses? I almost didn't recognize him at first. What does the woman mean? Number 19. I still don't feel well. I don't know what I'm going to do. I think the health center's open late tonight. What does the man imply the woman should do? Number 20. Say, Richard, if you like antique cars, we've got an extra ticket for the auto show on Saturday. Care to join us? Gee, how could I turn down an offer like that? What does the man mean? Go on to the next page. Number 21. That new soap I've been using lately smells nice, but it dries my skin out. It's probably all those harsh chemicals. You should try the kind I use. It's all natural. What does the man suggest the woman do? Number 22. That bread I bought yesterday isn't in the kitchen. Someone must have eaten it. Look on top of the refrigerator. What does the woman imply? Number 23. Can you believe this great gift Sharon sent you? I know. She really has a heart of gold. What can be inferred about Sharon? Number 24. I heard you auditioned for the chorus. How'd it go? Oh, well, the director has pretty high standards. I guess I just didn't measure up. What can be inferred about the man? Number 25. The weather is certainly unusual for this time of year. Yeah, so warm and humid. What does the man imply? Number 26. Basketball practice doesn't take a lot of time, does it? Only every spare minute. What does the man imply about basketball practice? Number 27. What are you doing here? You're not in the film class. I changed my schedule. Movies are a good change of pace from all these chemistry experiments. What does the man mean? Number 28. 
Waiting in line to copy just one page of an article wastes so much time. Have you ever tried the photocopier on the third floor of the library? I don't think as many people know about it. What does the man suggest that the woman do? Number 29. With all of these typos in this resume, you're not going to make a very good impression. Good thing it's on the word processor. What will the man probably do? Number 30. I have two exams and three papers to get done in the next couple of days. How do you get so backed up? What does the woman imply about the man? This is the end of Part A. Go on to the next page. Now read along as the directions for Part B are being read. Part B. Directions. In this part of the test, you will hear longer conversations. After each conversation, you will hear several questions. The conversations and questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Remember, you should not take notes or write on your test pages. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin Part B with the first conversation. Questions 31 through 33. Listen to a radio interview with the artistic director of a dance company. Today's arts report features Dan Parker of the American Indian Dance Theater. Mr. Parker, I understand your troupe performs traditional music and dance from many different Native American cultures. Can you give us an idea of some of the dances you'll be doing in your performance tonight? Certainly. We'll be doing one that's a war dance. Originally, it was a storytelling device to recount battles. Another is the grass dance performed by the Plains Indians, where they actually flatten tall field grass to prepare it for a ceremony. Since your dances are from many different tribes, how can you be sure the dances are done correctly? Everything we do has been approved by the elders of our tribes. That's partly because we don't necessarily know each other's styles or dances. But it's also because it's hard to get complete agreement, even within the same tribe, about exactly how the dance should be done. Anyone who attends one of your performances will notice that your company goes to a lot of trouble to provide detailed explanations of the origin of the dances, the music, the costumes, and so forth. Could you explain to our listeners why you do this? Good question. There are always concerns that traditional dances performed in a theater are nothing more than a spectacle. Our explanations show that in our cultures, dance is ritual rather than entertainment. We also want to make it clear to our audience that we are not performing any dances used for sacred ceremonies. Number 31. What is the main topic of the conversation? Number 32. What is the purpose of the interview? Number 33. 
Why are the dances approved by the elders of the tribes? Questions 34 through 37. Listen to a phone conversation between two friends who are discussing a problem. Hello? Hello, Sam. This is Paula Hansen. Sorry to bother you, but I'm having a small problem I thought you might be able to help me with. Sure, Paula. What's up? Well, you know Sarah and I moved into an off-campus apartment in the fall over on the west side of town. Anyway, we've been happy with it until the past couple of months. Yeah? What happened? Well, the dishwasher broke down. So we reported it to Ms. Connors, the owner. She said she'd take care of it, but a month went by and nothing happened. Did you get back in touch with her? I got a repair person to give me an estimate. Then I sent it to her. When I didn't hear from her, I had the repair done. And I deducted the cost from the rent check. So what's the problem? She called here mad as a hornet. She said she could have gotten the repair done for less money. Now, she's threatening to evict us for not paying the full rent. Hold on, Paula. It does sound pretty serious, but I'm sure you can all sit down and work this out. Well, you're over at the law school, so I wondered if you would mind coming with Sarah and me when we go to talk to Ms. Connors. We're supposed to meet with her tomorrow night at 8. Sure. I haven't studied a lot about contracts yet, but I'd be glad to help you straighten things out. Why don't I stop by about 7.30? Thanks, Sam. You're a lifesaver. Number 34. Why is Paula unhappy? Number 35. Why is Ms. Connors angry? Number 36. What are Paula and her roommate planning to do? Number 37. Why does Paula think Sam can help her? This is the end of Part B. Go on to the next page. Now read along as the directions for Part C are being read. Part C. Directions. In this part of the test, you will hear several short talks. After each talk, you will hear some questions. The talks and the questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, Find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Here is an example. On the recording you hear, Listen to an instructor talk to his class about a television program. I'd like to tell you about an interesting TV program that will be shown this coming Thursday. It will be on from 9 to 10 p.m. on Channel 4. It's part of a series called Mysteries of Human Biology. The subject of the program is the human brain, how it functions and how it can malfunction. Topics that will be covered are dreams, memory, and depression. These topics are illustrated with outstanding computer animation that makes the explanations easy to follow. Make an effort to see this show. Since we've been studying the nervous system in class, I know you'll find it very helpful. Now listen to a sample question. What is the main purpose of the program? In your test book, you read A. To demonstrate the latest use of computer graphics. 
B. To discuss the possibility of an economic depression. C. To explain the workings of the brain. D. To dramatize a famous mystery story. The best answer to the question, what is the main purpose of the program, is C. To explain the workings of the brain. Therefore, the correct choice is C. Now listen to another sample question. Why does the speaker recommend watching the program? In your test book, you read A. It is required of all science majors. B. It will never be shown again. C. It can help viewers improve their memory skills. D. It will help with coursework. The best answer to the question, why does the speaker recommend watching the program, is D. It will help with coursework. Therefore, the correct choice is D. Remember, you should not take notes or write on your test pages. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin Part C with the first talk. Questions 38 through 42. Listen to part of a lecture in speech class. Today we're going to practice evaluating the main tool used when addressing groups, the voice. There are three main elements that combine to create either a positive or negative experience for listeners. They can result in a voice that is pleasing to listen to and can be used effectively. Or they can create a voice that doesn't hold attention. Or even worse, causes an adverse reaction. The three elements are volume, pitch, and pace. When evaluating volume, keep in mind that a good speaker will adjust to the size of both the room and the audience. Of course, with an amplifying device like a microphone, the speaker can use a natural tone. But speakers should not be dependent on microphones. A good speaker can speak loudly without shouting. The second element, pitch, is related to the highness or lowness of the sounds. High pitches are, for most people, more difficult to listen to. So, in general, speakers should use the lower registers of their voice. During a presentation, it's important to vary pitch to some extent in order to maintain interest. The third element, pace, that is how fast or slow words and sounds are articulated, should also be varied. A slower pace can be used to emphasize important points. Note that the time spent not speaking can be meaningful too. Pauses ought to be used to signal transitions or create anticipation. Because a pause gives the listener time to think about what was just said, or even to predict what might come next, it can be very effective when moving from one topic to another. What I'd like you to do now is watch and listen to a videotape and use the forms I gave you to rate the speaking voices you hear. Then tonight, I want you to go home and read a passage into a tape recorder and evaluate your own voice. Number 38. What is the main point the professor makes? Number 39. According to the professor, what can a speaker do to keep an audience's attention? Number 40. What recommendation does the professor make about volume? Number 41. According to the professor, how can a speaker indicate that the topic is about to change?
Number 42. What are the students going to use a tape recorder for? Questions 43 through 46. Listen to part of a lecture at a museum. Let's proceed to the main exhibit hall and look at some of the actual vehicles that have played a prominent role in speeding up mail delivery. Consider how long it used to take to send a letter across a relatively short distance. Back in the 1600s, it took two weeks on horseback to get a letter from Boston to New York, a distance of about 260 miles. Crossing a river was also a challenge. Ferry service was so irregular that a carrier would sometimes wait hours just to catch a ferry. For journeys inland, there was always the stagecoach, but the ride was by no means comfortable because it had to be shared with other passengers. The post office was pretty ingenious about some routes. In the 19th century, in the southwestern desert, for instance, camels were brought in to help get the mail through. In Alaska, reindeer were used. This practice was discontinued because of the disagreeable temperament of these animals. We'll stop here a minute so that you can enter this replica of a railway mail car. It was during the age of the iron horse that delivery really started to pick up. In fact, the United States transported most bulk mail by train for nearly 100 years. The first air mail service didn't start until 1918. Please take a few moments to look around. I hope you'll enjoy your tour. And as you continue on your own, may I suggest you visit our impressive philatelic collection. Not only can you look at some of the more unusual stamps issued, but there's an interesting exhibit on how stamps are made. Number 43. What is the talk mainly about? Number 44. According to the speaker, why was it a problem for mail carriers to cross rivers in the 1600s? Number 45. What does the expression, the age of the iron horse, refer to? Number 46. What can be found in the museum's philatelic collection? Questions 47 through 50. Listen to the beginning of a talk on astronomy. Most people think of astronomers as people who spend their time in cold observatories peering through telescopes every night. In fact, a typical astronomer spends most of his or her time analyzing data and may only be at the telescope a few weeks of the year. Some astronomers work on purely theoretical problems and never use a telescope at all. You might not know how rarely images are viewed directly through telescopes. The most common way to observe the skies is to photograph them. The process is very simple. First, a photographic plate is coated with a light-sensitive material. The plate is positioned so that the image received by the telescope is recorded on it. Then the image can be developed, enlarged, and published so that many people can study it. Because most astronomical objects are very remote, the light we receive from them is rather feeble. But by using a telescope as a camera, long time exposures can be made. In this way, objects can be photographed that are a hundred times too faint to be seen by just looking through a telescope. Number 47. According to the speaker, what do people often think about astronomers? Number 48. 
What is one advantage of photographing the skies? Number 49. Why do astronomers often use photographic plates? Number 50. What is one reason astronomers make long time exposures? This is the end of Section 1. Turn off your cassette player. Set your clock for 25 minutes and begin work on Section 2.